familiar faces. Uh, I want to wish uh, everyone a happy, uh, una felice festa della donna, um, which uh, is the Italian for happy Women's Day, Women's Day. All right, well, without, without much uh, ado here, I really want to begin talking in, with you uh, about Ellen, the phenomenon that um, beginning in 2012 swept America away. And I say America because uh, in Italy, she is red, she was red, but uh, the, the, you know, not to the extent that we saw uh, in the United States and generally speaking abroad. Um, so, you know, we may ponder later on as to why, uh, but that's a question uh, that will be part of our conversation uh, in a bit. Before we start or to begin this conversation this afternoon, what I want to do is I want to, um, I want to tell you a little bit about what took me uh, to reading Ferrante. As you know, uh, modernism is not my uh, area of specialization. Uh, so I arrived at Ferrante as one from Naples. Uh, I am a Neapolitan. So going back, reading her in English first, then in Italian, and then again in English. So we can talk about our language later because I know that many people have wondered about the various, you know, what happened in the translation. So back to how I got to uh, Elena Ferrante. As I was reading it, one of the things that caught my attention was the fact that at a certain point, and precisely in book two, when she decided to, well, no, when she received a scholarship to live, to, to, to go basically to study uh, at the Università Normale di Pisa with a scholarship, she decided, she, uh, Elena Grieco, the, the protagonist, the main character, she decided to go on a farewell tour of the city of Naples. And in book two, uh, you will see, um, the, you know, in book two, you see that Ferrante, uh, the narrator, basically traces the path of uh, Elena Grieco's journey through the city of Naples as she says goodbye to her city. The next morning, she's gonna hop on a train and leave uh, her old neighborhood behind. I will do that with you this afternoon for a few moments, but what I want to underscore here, even before I start, is that the haphazard, or what apparently seems a haphazard way that she travels through Naples, Again, as a Neapolitan who knows that city very well, and, and we know that she does know the, the city very well, because later on uh, in another section of the, um, of the tetralogy, she will describe, uh, you know, her journey through the city. But in this case, on this occasion, she just does not do that. She basically goes and um, allow me to share my screen so you follow me more clearly. Here, here is what she does. Okay, so I think you can all see my screen, right? Um, Elena Grieco grows up basically in what is this part of the city, eastern part of Naples, even today, very industrial. Um, back then, even more so, I mean, today, industrial. Back then, it was, almost the, it was the outskirts, the periphery of Naples. So she grows up here. And the day she decides to say, the, the afternoon she decides to say goodbye to her city, she travels from the Rione Luzzati. This is the, um, this is the train station. And here you have Piazza Garibaldi. So she walks all the way up here. Then she goes on to this. Basically, she takes what it is Via dei Tribunali to end up Okay, so she goes this, she goes this, she ends up in Piazza Dante. This is the first stop. It is in Piazza Dante that she stops and takes up on a bus to, to go on to basically what will be, uh, just follow me a bit, to go from Piazza Dante to 
uh, the Vomero. Now, the Vomero up here is the most affluent to this day, the most affluent part of Naples. Um, she chooses that because supposedly she, that's where she has been tutoring children of wealthy families. So she is in Piazza Dante. Uh, and from Piazza Dante, once she's done uh, with her goodbyes, she goes to Piazza Van Vitelli. And from Piazza Van Vitelli, she says, you know, she doesn't take a bus, um, she doesn't take any of that, but she walks all the way to the Petraia. In other words, she goes backwards again. And I will show you more clearly in a moment on, on the Google map. But for, the uh, for now, so she goes back over here, she walks quite a distance. But once she's over here, approximately, she turns around, and decides that at this point, and I'm going to go to the next map, um, decides that, at that from there she will take um, the funicular or the funivia to get down to Piazza Medeo over here. In other words, just to recap, she's done, she's gone from my right to the left, then she's gone right again to go to the left, left further, and then here, once in Piazza Medeo, again, this is, the, this is the journey of somebody who's going back and forth. You would almost think that once she's back here, she, were, she, she was about to go back home, but she doesn't. She retraces her step. She goes down to Piazza Medeo. From Piazza Medeo, she, she walks again to uh, Via Filangieri. And Via Filangieri is this one. In other words, she's gone all of, from here down to here to Via Filangieri. And then, lo and behold, at this point, she says, oh, I was so close to Piazza dei Martiri at that point that I decided to just take a few more, you know, walk a little further and go where Lila's shop, Lila um, uh, shoe store was. Now here is Piazza, um, Piazza dei Martiri, um, uh, which is near the Riviera di Chiaia. Um, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a place uh, even today. So I'm going to recap all of what I said and I hope it was clear uh, with, uh, with the Google map because I want you to see uh, again, perhaps even more clearly. Okay, so I'm on Google map. And if, uh, here I am. So this is what she does. I'm a little bit off here. Okay, so here is the train station right over here. Well, okay, oops. From the train station, from the train station and to the Vomero up here, then back to here, only to turn around and then to arrive basically over here, the Achiaia Piazza dei Martiri. Okay, so you will say, what about this? What, what, what's this uh, going back and forth? Which is exactly what I asked myself, because uh, as one who's lived in Naples for uh, years after Ferran, after Elena Drieco, it made no sense to me, except for if this were the journey of somebody who's undecided who's about to leave and begin a new life as a student uh, and, a, um, and a scholarship in a very, very prestigious um, university. And one who's really still toying with that idea. And that's what then brought me to the next idea, which was, wait, isn't this the journey that every woman has to face as she begins? Her, uh, her, her, her path or journey to independence. And what is independence for a woman or I, I dare say for anyone? Now, other things that came into, uh, that I considered were the places she traveled, basically 
uh, you know, think in terms of, uh, even if you don't know um, much history, uh, when we go to, um, when we think of Garibaldi, uh, Garibaldi in Italian history is the one who really was the hero of the Italian unification. And by the way, he did not do it all on his own. On his side, he had a woman, he, has, he had his wife, Anita, who, who will die much before he did and so forth and so on. Then she goes to Piazza Garibaldi. Uh, I'm sorry, from Piazza Garibaldi, she goes to Piazza Dante. Well, who's Dante? If not the one who wrote about the journey par excellence about you know, self-discovery, the journey inward so that you can then face the world. Um, if you go through all the places that she stops in and goes by, you will see that there is always a reference to a woman. Piazza dei Martiri in particular then, it's, it's, the, it's the square that celebrates the martyrs. And in Greek, uh, the etymological uh, origin of that word is the one who witnesses. So I'm thinking of all these things as I'm then reading through uh, Elena Grieco's journey. A couple more uh, things before uh, we start conversing about Elena. So, so maybe Elena is, as she traverses the city, she is still undecided, we said it. The other thing that catches one's attention is the fact that as she travels through that city, she never talks. She's a silent observer. So in a way, she's very different from the heroines that those, um, that those um, you know, places commemorate. Uh, because you know, to live in a city, it's to be part of a community. And that means also to participate actively, to be engaged. Well, Elena does not show that. She do, she's just going through. Um, so what I, what I call that is Elena really trying to firm up her decision. She wants to go, but she has still to discover who she really is. So in that, in, in that we can see the young woman and, and perhaps women, you know, the world over, who are trying hard to make all this, to take the first step towards what will be then their lives. Now, as I think of Elena Ferrantes and uh, today's co um, celebration in particular, um, I, I want to remind everybody that uh, for this year, um, the, uh, the theme is uh, for women, Women's Day is women in leadership, um, achieving uh, an equal future in a COVID-19 world. Well, it's a good title for today, for our, for our times, because it's certainly, um, we're gonna have to look at the, at the role of women in, in a COVID and post COVID world. But then think back about all the, um, all the hurdles that this young woman, Elena Grieco, has to uh, overcome in order to affirm herself. And that's not just Elena Grieco, because it, it, there is also Elena Ferrante. Um, I can't help to think that Elena, Elena Grieco is the mirror of Elena Ferrante, simply because eventually Grieco will, will overcome all the obstacles that life puts in front of her. And, but, but so does Ferrante. If you think of the, um, if you think of the, um, of the success she has had, in a world, in an industry dominated by male. Uh, so, you know, both of these characters could be taken as specular uh, images of each other. So again, to recap, uh, a journey through a city which is her own, which, is, which she knows very well, but through which she never utters a word. A word. And that's, that's uh, eye-opening. Um, a city that, is, that has layer after layer of history. And if she, Elena uh, Grieco, were to stop and only for a moment think about well, what does all of this mean, uh, then perhaps she could also understand what she is looking for. And by that I mean through learning about the city, she could also learn about herself. And I'm leading here to self-knowledge, which is essentially what Elena uh, Grieco at this stage of her journey lacks. She's in a labyrinth, which like all labyrinths, 
you know, imply running around in circles to trying to find that center place. And it's, that's precisely what Elena does when she goes from east to west, back to east, halfway to west, then she goes down and then she goes to Piazza Lima. Elena is in a labyrinth. This is the labyrinth of selfhood. She needs to discover who she is. She will do it years later. But at this stage, she is one who, you know, is, is, is trying very hard to discover who she is and what, what can her future be? be unless, um, what can her future be? But I repeat, before she can even entertain those thoughts, we, she needs to discover who she is. Of course, when she discovers it um, in the, in the um, you know, at, at this stage, um, in other words, when she goes down to Piazza dei Martiri, where her friend Lila is, she will discover, she will find Lila in the shoe store with her, uh, with the man sh she, Elena, loves. At this point, Lila and Nino have, um, are in a relationship, um, uh, even though, you know, Elena loves, uh, loves Nino and Lila is married to another man. So you can see where uh, this reckoning with the reality comes for Elena at the end of that labyrinthine walk through the city of Naples. Um, I really want to stop right now because, you know, um, I, I'm much, I would like to, uh, to hear your questions, your comments. One last thing, if uh, I will add is that we know that like every woman, um, Elena is looking for freedom. She wants freedom from the, uh, from the neighborhood, from the poor neighborhood. She wants fr freedom and independence from her family. Um, and she doesn't know how to get it. She believes and she knows uh, approximately, I say, that by educating herself, she will be able to achieve that. What she does not know yet is the kind of responsibility that will come with her independence. And even before that, the kind of self-knowledge that she needs to achieve that independence. Uh, and that, yeah, and, uh, that independence. So I'm gonna stop right here and I'm going to open the floor to uh, questions um, and comments. By the way, I have to add one last thing. I'm by no means an expert on Ferrante. I was just having fun with, with her and the way uh, and the city of Naples. I, th I think that your description of that is something that as a reader, not knowing Naples at all, would have been lost in terms of the actual labyrinth that she was going through, not necessarily that she was looking for something herself, in herself, but that was great. Um, Thank you. Would have known. Yeah, I, I can understand that. I can understand that. Um, but I have to tell you, uh, as a result of the fame, you know, of these uh, of these uh, stories, of these books, of this author, you know, the the fame that has come from the page to the stage, uh, they now have in Naples tours of uh, Elena Ferrante's uh, walks and maps. So anybody who's who's in for it, they can go. <laughs> um, you you mentioned an, a number of things that. Um... She, she had to um, reckon with in, in order to come of age. Um, but uh, doesn't she, she also have to reckon with her dependence on, on Leela? And um, the, I wonder if you can talk about that a little bit. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Our dependence from Lila. And when we now, if we move to this side of the story, I will say that I have a little uh, much less sympathy for Elena Grieco. Um, in other words, um, Lila is the brilliant friend. Um, Elena uh, wants to emulate her. Um, Elena at first uh, believes that Lila has made it 
because Lila's got money. She's married into money. And so she begins this kind of, uh, uh, well, the friendship, which began when they were in, in the grammar school and all began, you know, with, with losing uh, some dolls, now develops into something that is much more complex. Um, the, um, the dependency from, from Lila is one that uh, Elena needs because the courageous one between the two is absolutely Lila. So in that respect, um, I, I think you're correct when you say that uh, there is such a thing. Now, you have also to remember that, or we need to remember that the, the story, the narration of the story begins only after Lila's death. So retrospectively, Elena is writing when Lila is already died. That again is a, is a reminder that Lila is only independent after her friend's death. Um, was Elena or Lenuccia wishing death on her friend? Absolutely not, no. But of the two, the real independent individual, the one who really fought the world and the neighborhood really, is Lila. Um, so absolutely, I don't know if I'm answering your, your question, but the, the, there, is, there is a dependency and it, and it really persists throughout the four, um, the tetralogy, the four uh, novels. So she, she uh, I will add, I'm not sure that uh, Elena wants to cut that all together. Uh, I'm not sure, but, but the independence come after, comes after Lila's death. I have a question. Does Leela die? At the end, she disappears. It's not clear that she dies. To me, it didn't seem. Right. She disappears. You're then, correct. You know, she sends the doll back to Elena. And then you're left with, whoa, you know, where did she right. go? They don't really say. So, I mean, she what? disappears and disappears from Elena's uh, life. But to me, it wasn't clear that she died. I, I okay. agree with that. I agree. Okay. Fine yeah. with me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 I think uh, um, Ferrante probably kind of revels in that uh, ambiguity at the end, leaving right. everybody, you know, maybe even a, no, not a sequel, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I think she well, likes leaving you kind of up in the air. In a way, we have a sequel, which is not really sequel. If you read her latest publication, uh, The Lying Life of the Adults, um, you will see that in Young Giovanna, uh, th there are there are traces, and to me, they are very strong traces of a combination of Lila, who's now strong, and, 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 and Elena. Uh, look, I don't disagree with you. We don't have a death certificate, uh, but by, by all, uh, from all that we know about Lila, I, I cannot help to think that she's gone yeah. and she's gone from this life, but it's okay. I mean, either way, again, there is no death certificate. I, I have a I'm, question and a, and a comment, uh, Susie Voigt um, speaking. Um, my uh, hearing us talk about it this way is the, the book of the four that was the least interesting to me, in fact, was the part about Elena when she's married and living up north. I remember getting really bored in that third book and wondering, but then I went on to the fourth book and, and, and of course the lost child in some ways was one of the most fascinating books. So you can see it reflected in the books about, about the leading character and the um, leadership that that character was providing to the whole um, environment that they were in. My, my other, but my question for you is especially because you're from Naples and I'm not from Naples or if Elena Ferrante is truly uh, the woman that they seem to have identified in Rome, uh, since you're in Neapolitan and in, in, in Napolitana and she's not, how did that feel as someone who so intimately knows Naples and then finding out that the author wasn't from Naples? This was some sort of northerner's view of what Naples is like. I know she was married, I mean, if, if they've identified it correctly. And, and that was very interesting to me because it, uh, knowing Italy in the small way I know it, it's a different world. All right, a couple of things. First, to uh, the book that you found less interesting. Uh, I have to say that for those of us who are in academia, that was in fact very um, 
interesting, very fascinating, simply mm. because it spoke very accurately of the world of academia with all of its ups and downs and, you know, with, with all those things that happen in academia. So that gave it away. I mean, this person, the one who was talking, knew exactly what that, that world was like. So um, that's with a reference to your comment. As for being Neapolitan and not Neapolitan, um, I believe that, in fact, Elena Ferrante comes from a Neapolitan family, uh, a Jewish mother, a uh, Neapolitan father who then moved to Rome to be a magistrate or something along those lines. So she has, and in fact, if you read some of her, um, uh, well, in front of my, uh, or some of her other uh, essays, she, she will describe Naples as her city. And, and she will say, she, she says, you know, I've never felt in a city as part of a city as I feel in Naples. So um, she is writing as a Neapolitan. Okay. She has a firm command of that city. Uh, again, if you look at the other parts where, um, you know, Elena Grieco decides to skip school because, you know, she's, she, she's down. She doesn't, she doesn't think she's as good as, uh, as Nino or Lila. And she skips school and she, uh, you know, she takes notes. She, she writes notes in the morning for herself. Uh, where is she going to go today? And if you go through those notes, they make a lot of sense. They, uh, they coherently and logically um, go through the city of Naples. So uh, yes, uh, Ferrante knows not Naples. She has she's from that background um, and so forth and so on. Thank you. Right. I'm curious as to what um, people think about the depiction of female friendships. Because if, if we want to be provocative here, it's the international, it's International Women's Day, that um, if, if, if I want to play devil's advocate, here is this relationship between these two women who from their childhood, are they friends? Are they not friends? Do they, 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 are they friends or they're, they're, they're kind of frenemies? And, and what this, um, you know, I, I think one of the reasons that I had difficulty kind of entering into, I, I, I read and I really enjoyed La Vita Bugiarda de Diaduti. I had difficulty getting into not the world of Naples because she, she constructs the city, just it's so vivid, it's so beautiful, those, those depictions. But the relationship between these two, these two women that is, they're competitive, they're, they're jealous. There is this, I, I didn't, these aren't the kind of relationships that I, I don't know. I, I'm curious as to, as the kind of the, the more, I had a very visceral reaction to, to reading of, of, of this, of for this relationship develop. It seemed like this um, really negative friendship. Um, and I had trouble with it. I'm, cu I'm curious as to what other people thought. Uh, in going back and picking you back with uh, Susan's question, um, there's a rumor that Elena Ferrante is not really a woman. It's, there's a man that oh. it's, it's hiding behind the name Elena Ferrante. Professor Palma, I see you're smiling. Could you comment on that, please? I'll be more than happy to comment on that. And as a matter of fact, that was one of the reasons why I got into these books. I have to say, um, there was a, a colleague in the English department uh, at Southern who had read them before me and was just ta telling me how great these were. And so I, you know, I began, and that was around the time when, uh, if you read any uh, essays or, um, you know, the New York Times uh, book review, uh, you would read comments, you know, type of, of the kind. They are, th these are so well written. It, it, only a man could write them, could write these stories <laughs> so well. So, <laughs> uh, so in, in celebration of Women's Day, I would suggest, uh, uh, I would suggest for everyone who has, who has any doubt. And, and look, I don't care who the author is. I have no interest in that. What fascinates me about the possibility of an author being a translator, German, Italian, that, that is a whole other dimension, but that's, and that's okay, we'll set that aside. But what you need to read um, are, is, is, the, is the novel, The Days of Abandonment, where in that novel, 
in that work, you can read um, about a, a woman being abandoned, abandoned by her husband. The psychological depth that that novel, um, uh, that emerges from that novel, it, it's just, um, it, it can be, this, is, this had to be a woman who was behind that narrative. Uh, I have to say that was my convincing, uh, that was what convinced me that, you know, it, it, it couldn't be. I mean, yeah, um, no. So Professor Di Pietro, uh, absolutely not. It's not a man. And yes, it is written so well that uh, only a woman could have written it that <laughs> way. And then to Professor Larkin with, uh, with, uh, with her comment about friendship. I wasn't I would... suggesting that, by the way. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I was, I was, I was replying. Uh... Well, you know, I'm Neapolitan. I hop from one to the other. I, I enjoy talking. But, but, but uh, to your comment earlier on about, well, what kind of friendship is this? Uh, my, my question, and it's not a question, my comment is, but isn't that what friendships okay, wait, wait. Are, all, are all about? In other words, in my experience, friendship is, is not about agreeing on, every, on everything all the time. Friendship is especially disagreeing and then coming together on the important matters. And that's precisely what Lila and, um, and Elena Grieco will do. I mean, Lila will literally pay for Elena's books when she's still in, uh, in uh, high school. And it will be Elena who will go and rescue Lila or try to rescue her when she, once she abandons her husband and moves on to, um, you know, to the periphery once again. I mean, here the theme of the periphery and the center, city and periphery, mm -hmm. really played very heavily. So yes, they, there are moments that the two, um, that there is tension between the two. There are moments when, you know, Elena will say, I detest her. After all, she has taken my Nino. But then, you know, if you take a step back, well, Elena never really was with Nino or Nino with Elena. Nino and Elena, their relationship, it's all based on intellectual, you know, um, uh, superiority I and mean, who's better than the other, you know. Uh, Elena believes forever that Nino uh, knows more than she does. She will only discover in the end that Nino has been plagiarizing all the things that she has written. So, you know, it, it's really complex uh, as, mm -hmm. as um, when, when we speak about friendships. Um, can just, yeah, yes, Mr. Yes, Ferran. Uh, <clears throat> I was, uh, in addition to obviously enjoying the, the, the books and the, and the main characters, I was interested in trying to find references uh, among the secondary characters and the way that they behaved as a connection to my own personal references to the Neapolitan culture, having, been, having grown up and been raised in a Neapolitan uh, affected enclave in New Haven, in Worcester Square, where so many of the immigrants who came to Worcester Square came from the, the, the area around Naples. And so all of the cultural references that I uh, grew up appreciating all seem to have their connections to how the Neapolitans behaved and the uh, cultural references that they use as part of their interaction with each other. And I was, I was trying to find those references in the secondary characters, the parents, the neighbors, how they interacted with each other, uh, the importance of, uh, of saving face, of, of being able to present yourself in a certain way, how devastating it is when something happens. Um, that uh, causes you public embarrassment. All of these things that are so deeply ingrained in the, in the cultural references that I grew up understanding as being important, uh, I was really looking for those, you know, to see how well she was able to uh, reflect those in her characters and in the situations as they developed, especially in the neighborhood. Um, 
And just, you know, of course, this is uh, post-war Italy uh, beyond uh, the, you know, the Italian uh, um, cultural references that most of the people I grew up with uh, could relate to. But um, for me, it was, it was a very interesting um, opportunity to see how well she was able to capture that. And to some degree, I thought she did because the, and then, you know, watching, I don't know how many of you did or didn't watch the TV adaptation of it. I was mm-hmm. fascinated to see how well they captured the Neapolitan dialect, which I grew up with. Um, and, you know, some of them um, were okay, but they didn't quite get it, at least not, you know, with the level of comfort that the, that the nonnas in my neighborhood spoke the Neapolitan Italian uh, that we all, we all understood. So uh, I found that uh, that was a, a particular interest for me was to try to reference uh, all of those cultural um, family oriented, neighborhood oriented relationships and uh, whether or not uh, I was able to understand them as I understood them from my own personal experience. So that was as important to me as it was to follow the storyline. Excellent. And, and, and you found them and you enjoyed them. Did I did not? find them. I did enjoy them. Yes, some of them were subtle and some of them were um, not easily understood if you didn't understand you know, the, the Italian, the importance that the Italian culture gives to certain qualities in men and women and their traditional roles. And then as it evolved, which I found interesting as the characters evolved, of course, that was, you know, bringing, bringing their characters into, into a modern reference, but there were still those connections to you know, those traditional worlds of how a mother should behave and how a father should behave. And, uh, and in particular, you know, living within those communities, close, close quarters, people living in, you know, on top of each other in apartment houses uh, and how important the inter, interconnections are and how important it is to present yourself in a certain way in public. Yeah. Um, that you can't, lose, you can't lose face and you can't, you know, you can't have people think the less of you because of some, you know, some behavior that was inappropriate. Absolutely. So I, I enjoy that as much as I enjoyed, you know, all of the other characters. Excellent. Very good. I'm happy. Uh, the thing to perhaps say a couple words about is the, uh, the dialect or the language. Um, I should note that even in the Italian version, uh, the dialect is never spoken. Um, what the narrator says, um, she will say, well, and then they switch to dialect. In other words, in the Italian version, you never have um, perhaps well, once, twice, but I don't remember any more than those uh, occasions, than two occasions at the most, an actual dialect spoken. But there is uh, the the um, uh, the indication that you know in the in the neighborhood they spoke dialect. Now much has been made about, uh, particularly in, uh, with the American uh, public, about you know the what does it mean to switch register uh, and then to speak. Uh, Italian or standard Italian. Um, I, I will say that, as you all know, a dialect is always the language of familiarity and so forth and so on. Uh, whereas um, when Elena wants to be um, wants to become part of, uh, you know, when Elena wants to escape from the periphery, she will switch and speak standard Italian the whole time. Uh, that's another indication that she's at it, she needs to move on. Um, but that doesn't mean that going back when she returns, she doesn't change and adapt her, her, her language to that reality, to the reality of the whole neighborhood. Now, this switching back and forth, um, which as I said, has been so, you know, um, uh, it's been much analyzed to me as an Neapolitan, 
it's indicative of just having familiarity with more than one language and opting for one when you want to speak to your within your family. And even there, um, nowadays especially, it is it is spoken um, on particular particular occasions, not all the time. Um, we're speaking um, the relying on the standard Italian is 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 to have you know, to be part of that bigger ge uh, geographical reality, which is Italy. So I think that uh, we can think of Neapolitans today as Elena was, uh, was back then in the early uh, 60s, you know, she wanted to be part of a bigger picture and she switched gear um, or registered from Neapolitan to Dalek. So this is with reference, uh, uh, Mr. Carano, to your to your comment about you know I was looking for a dialect. Um, in the Italian version, dialect is is mentioned as the language that was switched to, but not exactly as a spoken language. What do you make of that choice? What do you make of it? Because if we if you're thinking of like the neorealist mode of filmmaking, but also the literary sources, um, they're I, I mean, the impulse would have been to use dialect, to insert dialect. What do you what do you make of the use of dialect only in a reported fashion? Well, to be cynical, uh, then it wouldn't have been understood and it wouldn't have sold as well as it did in Italy, well, uh, number one. Yeah, but yes more to no. the point, mm -hmm. more to the point, I, I think that in, in, uh, in the language, uh, we should see um, you know, this idea, this is a young woman who is trying to move beyond, to move ahead. And she knows that she could do it either through wealth, she doesn't have access to, Lila does. And that's why Lila can afford not to speak Italian mm -hmm. as much as Elena. So Elena's way out of, of the neighborhood is with, with a language that is considered um, educated. Uh, and in fact, she will be considered the one who has a good answer for everything. She's very logical. She's very poised, you know. Um, so I, I, the choice in that language is showing even through language that this is a woman who has to find her way. And one of her ways is going to be through language also. May I say something about the dialects? Please. <laughs> I was, I'm Abruzzese, I was born in uh, post-World War II Italy. And we grew up speaking a dialect, but in Italy now, hardly anybody else speaks dialects. That's number one. Number two, I heard from my friends in Italy that when they showed the adaptation, in Italy of the first book, they had to do it with Italian subtitles because mm -hmm. the Italians didn't understand the type of deep Neapolitan. And I usually do understand Neapolitan, but I had to read the uh, subtitles as well. But the fact that in the adaptation, they did use the dialects to me made it more real. Because in post-World post War II Italy, especially in the first book, when it was so near the war, uh, I mean, people, for the most part, unless they lived in a city, unless they were of a certain economic back background, they did not speak Italian. Okay? I spoke dialect until the first day I went to school. And then that's when I started speaking Italian there. Okay? So... You know, the fact that she mentions that, you know, that they speak in, in dialect is very real. And the fact that you said that, you know, she had to write in Italian because very few people in Italy would have understood. I absolutely agree with you 100% there. And the uh, one little anecdote, it's funny because my best friend, my best childhood friend from Italy, uh, she, I taught languages here in the United States. I'm retired now, and she taught Italian. Whenever we get together, we start in Italian, and undoubtedly, after five minutes, we go back to the dialect. And it is the funniest thing. We're sitting at the table, 
I talk to her kids and her husband and her grandkids in Italian, and so does she. And then we go back to talk to each other and it goes back into dialect because that was the unif one of the unifying factors in our lives. You're, you're, uh, you're giving us a beautiful example of what it means in Italy to use a dialect. Now, just mm -hmm. as you don't understand uh, Neapolitan, I cannot understand other dialects yeah. such as, you know, perhaps your Abruzzese or, um, you know, Sicilian or, or any others. Yeah. Well, my um, sister-in-law is Sicilian, cannot so, understand her. So, so we have this fragmentation within Italy uh, when, if, we, if we rely on dialects. And you're absolutely right. There, was, there is need for that reason when they showed, an, when they showed the, 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 the movies. Um, the, there is a need for subtitles. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, at the same time, it is also true that the switching of register and changing from Italian to a dialect or in, specifically in Neapolitan, makes the whole story much more realistic. Um, and I noticed that as the more education she received, uh, Elena Griego, the more Italian or a more literate Italian came out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's possible, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's By the way, one of one of the uh, one of the um, criticism that I had that I have read about this novel um, is that it is much better in English than in Italian. Uh, it's easier I, to read in English than no, 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 no. But this was by this was by a scholar who's, who's fluent, who speaks, and who uh, made all sort of uh, um, you know objections to the way that uh, uh, the narrator Ferrante writes in Italian. And that's a whole other ball game. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, I totally disagree. Of course, uh, I think. I think that uh, the translation in English li leaves much to be desired, uh, but that's okay. I mean, you know, this is the best we get and we're happy mm -hmm. with it, mm -hmm. but, but it's not a grand translation. There are, there are things that are really off. Yeah, yeah. No. that's okay. I mean, th here we're Traditore, talking about- Traditore, traditore, so. Well, they say that too. Well, it <laughs> shouldn't be that way though. I know, I know. I have a question. Yeah. Full disclosure, I have yet to um, see the HBO series as well as read the books, but there I've heard there's fascinating, so I will be seeing them, especially after this conversation. With that being said, um, so if I'm understanding this correctly, these are these um, books as well as the films in Italy were offered in Italian, but also in the dialect as well? No, let me, let me, let me explain. They were written in Italian. Yes. Uh, sometime throughout the novels, um, the, the, the narrator will say, you know, Elena was talking to Lila and she switched to dialect and then okay. describes the conversation in Italian. But we know as readers, we've been alerted to the fact that the conversation is gone to dialect. Okay. But no, they are written in Italian. They're then okay. translated in 40 plus languages. Because wouldn't you want it in Italian, like the Italian standard language, if you will, so that everyone can read it and understand it in Italy? Wouldn't that make more sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank yeah. you. No <laughs> problem. I have a comment. Yes. Um, I noticed that all the books and books by Domenic, Domenico Scarnone and Jumpa, Jumpa, Jumpa Lahiri, they're all translated by um, the same woman, Anne Goldstein. Mm -hmm. um, she must be quite the Italian translator. Well, yes, after, translator, uh, after translating Elena Ferrante, uh, you are such a translator. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm. Yes, she's, she's very well known. And uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Not a problem. I have a question. And- um, Professor Filantese. <laughs> and also full disclosure, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say that being from Naples myself, I have not yet read Ferrante's works. But um, from, <laughs> from, the, um, from what I'm hearing, and I heard you say, and thank you so much for this presentation, um, 
I, you made some reference to women in um, historically like um, Anita Garibaldi for Piazza Garibaldi, etc. I'm wondering, and I know nothing about these works, if any reference has been made to the myth of Partenope, of um, because it, it feels so, I mean, everything that is being said now speaks to that, uh, um, that figure, the mythical uh figure. Uh, absolutely, uh, and that's part that uh, that's a part I did not go in. But uh, of course, Parthenope being the uh, the mythical siren, um, and whose and whose body or dead body, you know, and whose tomb the city uh, was was then uh, founded founded. But uh, there is Parthenope in a place quite a role. Um, remember um, the uh, you know the other thing that I uh, yes, um, I, I mean. For the sake of, of time, I did not go into that. But uh, the one thing that I will say is that, for example, when we talk of the journey of, uh, of Elena, Elena Greco's journey, she's taking, she's, she's journeying just like, as I said, Dante did, but also like Don Quixote did, like Ulysses did. It's a, it's a, it's a journey to discover oneself. And it is within this, within this idea of discovery. I mean, when you think of Ulysses, I mean, the first thing that, yeah, the siren, the sirens that attract them. Now with, with Partenope, there is also one other, um, one other element. And that is to say that one of the streets that um, Elena Grieco makes up makes a point to, to walk by as she goes back and forth is via, Luigi, uh, via um, Luisa San Felice. Now, San Felice is of course the aristocrat who in the, um, who in the 18th century, I'm sorry, 19th century, no, go back, 18th century, was the one who led, was an aristocrat who led um, a revolt against the Neapolitan monarchy so that they could establish the Parthenopean Republic. So, you know, there are many references to Parthenope, but not as directly in the walk that she takes. Um, and I, you know, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Good point, thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have another question. You, you said you weren't entirely satisfied with the translation, uh, is there, could you, it might be difficult to explain exactly why, but I'd be curious as to what, what you find, found kind of lacking in the English translation. Well, it's a very technical, uh, some of the things that um, Elena expresses, they are translated somewhat literally um, in some parts. I mean, the silliest example that I can give you, and this is, I, I grant you, this is the silliest example, uh, because there are issues that are far greater. In one instance, there is, the narrator says that so-and-so, and, -so, and I, don't, I don't remember the name, so-and-so was incinta. In Italian, incinta means to be expecting, to be pregnant. The translator translates, so-and-so had a belt. That's oh, really silly, yeah. that's that's, just, that's and that's silly. the silliest of the examples. It's it's much more it's much more complex than that. Is it, it, it doesn't? I'm sorry. Could it be the fact that idiomatic things really oftentimes are not translatable? Oh yeah, yes, right. To me, I find that you know I have an Italian friend who I communicate with pretty regularly, and I try. You know, sometimes we'll use um, uh, idioms in our own particular languages and try to explain them to the other person. And it's um, it's sometimes almost impossible. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Idiomatic expressions are the ones that will will get any translator, mm -hmm. drive any translator mad and uh, up to a wall. Yeah, but, but again, I mean, overall, it's a good job. Yes. It's a good job. I have a question on how you felt because uh, how the books compared to the series, because I'll just say in one sentence, I found them much more grim, the, the films, the, the joy of the books, because the books were, were, were not always happy stories, but there was a joy of life that did come through that I felt the films 
uh, the series did not convey well. But I would be interested to hear what other people thought. I love these books and read them quite a while ago in English, but quite a while ago. Perhaps we can ask the rest of the uh, of the participants to comment on this. I, I mean, um, I, I am no uh, expert on, I, on film just, and cinema, so I, I can't. I just want to say something about the dialects, Professor Paul. Yes. Someone said something about the I'm Neapolitan, supposedly. Oh, <laughs> I, I call myself Campano. I live at the border with Lazio. In my dialect Mark. versus in Naples, it's slightly different. Mm, sure. I met people from Avellino and they speak Neapolitan and it's slightly different. And the idiomatic expressions in, in my language are different. For example, the word bello, we say bello. Next village, they say bello. Mm -hmm. Next village, two miles away. So how are you going to have a Neapolitan? I say I speak Neapolitan. Yeah, <clears throat> like we mean different things, even an object that we use. And so Elena Ferranti, for I believe it was Professor Lars, uh, Larkin that mentioned, they're in competition since first grade in competition, first grade. You're in a small village, in a small village, in a small region in Napoli. You're in competition. In our village, the girls only went to fifth grade. I'm talking about 1958-60. The men went all the way up. Out of the eight boys, one, one was a general. Okay. A village of 100 people, not 5,000, not 2,000, 110. Now there's only 20. Okay. Oh, wow. And so <clears throat> when you speak the dialect, whether it's Sicilian, Calabrese, Neapolitan, uh, Piemontese, each village is its own almost vocabulary. Yeah, it's true. And, and, you know, I mean, it, it makes all the sense if you think that... Uh, and that's why the, I think Ferrante wrote it in Italian. Because otherwise, you have all type of interpretations. But she, she did one thing. She proposed that the women, if they put their minds to it, they can succeed. And, but they have to fight for every step of the way, just as if you come from a small place. You don't just go from poor to Harvard or from poor to the Nobel Prize. Yeah. You have to work, work, and prove yourself all the way along. Absolutely, absolutely, mm. and, and that's precisely what uh, Elena Grieco will do. You know, she will uh, she will work hard to uh, to to to. Uh, shine at uh, at, um, at, uh, at, uh, at the University of Pisa, La Normale di Pisa. Um, but then, once again, she as a woman will have to confront um, the skeletons in the closet. Yeah. And, and, but that's also part of that learning um, uh, journey, uh, which earlier on we, we described it as, you know, the journey that any, every human being has to uh, undertake, and I, I mentioned Ulysses and you know Lancelot or or uh, Don Quixote or um, uh, Dante, but in those cases, those were all men. Interestingly, here we have a, a young woman who, who you know, and, and who then begins about Partenope. Partenope, if you if you know the Neapolitan history, there was the name that the Greeks gave to Naples. Absolutely. And so yes. sometimes if you read the newspapers, in Naples is, it's referred to as Partenopeo or Partenope. And that's what they came from. Absolutely, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. I have a comment about since you're speaking of all these journeys, I, you know, from the very beginning when I started reading it, I thought it was very, very interesting that her last name was Grieco. 
coming from Naples, having Naples being populated by the Greeks. And mm. now you're speaking of Ulysses. So mm -hmm. it's like Angela Greco, yes. <laughs> no, it's like I, I think that's the so reference of Parthenope. Grecian, Greco. Mm -hmm. Yes. Greco. Sure, Greco is a very um, is 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 a, is is by all means uh, a southerner, but particularly Neapolitan uh, last name surname. So we find yes, quite that, a few of them. yeah, because I mean it was established by the Greeks, so mm -hmm. I can understand that it is a popular last name. But I mean, does Ferrante give Elena the last name because it's popular, or because she wants us from the beginning to put? The idea of a journey into our minds. Well, that's a good question. That's absolutely a good question. Uh, remember, also, she goes on to study classics at uh, Pisa. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, with, that is, is a possibility and uh, actually a strong possibility, a combination of the two. I see a couple of hands up, and I'm wondering if, uh, yes, Ms. Schneider? Yes, I have the disadvantage of not knowing any of the Italian language, but having read the books, which I thought were absolutely brilliant. I couldn't put them down. I, I, I was so enthralled by it. I've traveled to Italy a lot and did. I spent some time in Naples after I read the series. So it was kind of interesting for me to walk around and we went to Ischia, is that how you pronounce the island? Yes. I thought that the, doc, the, the uh, movies that they did, that HBO did were equally as brilliant. I mean, the cinematography was excellent. And I thought that they did a great job Tr you know, tr not translating from Italian to, to whatever, but translating from a book to a visual. It was exactly as I pictured it when I was watching. I was like, oh my God, you know, whoever, whoever did this and whoever cast the characters did a brilliant job. And I know they were up for HBO, they were up for an, for an award, for an Emmy. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought it was great. And I, I, loved, I loved the book, the books. Excellent, thank you. I have to tell you, you know, much to the dismay of Neapolitans, because I happened to be there two years ago. I don't remember when it was at this point, but they were shooting the, sec the, the, the series, the last series that we saw. And, you know, the city was blocked and everybody was tearing their hair apart uh, off because mm -hmm. it was, you know, some of those scenes, some of the scenes were taken, um, were shot right in the city. So it, it's good, but it, it was good to see. Uh, Neapolitans are are very proud of this now, you know, mm -hmm. as, a, as the movie that is being. Yes. Uh, well, the, the I they... Oh, go ahead. No, 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 go. They no, no. You. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I have a comment in related to Professor Larkin's comment about friendship. And I think that this particular friendship is so long lasting because they like each other, they don't like each other, there's competition. Leela is clearly very, very, very intelligent, possibly more so than Elena, mm -hmm. and natively so. Uh, Elena worked harder because, and I never quite figured it, think about why Leela, Leela somehow had to keep destroying herself uh, from what she was what she started out, uh, she couldn't be as good as she really was for somebody that sort of self-destruction, which I think happens with many, many people. They have a talent and then something goes and, and they don't fulfill some native, uh, native talent. But I think the idea of the friendship is something that it lasted for 40 years, uh, this back and forth, and I, don't, I think that's probably sort of common. There's so many ways of having friends, which kinds of friends are situational friends, which kinds of friends are deep friends, uh, which ones are because you do the same thing at the same time and then you grow apart. But there are some friends who are always there forever. And that's, I think the, and I don't know if women have more friends that, like that than men. Uh, I, I have a feeling we do, but I don't know that for positiveness. Um, anyway, the idea of friendship. Uh, that, that, 
thank you for elaborating on, on the idea of friendship. Um, but, but back to, to the comment with regard to, to your observation about uh, Lila being uh, less interested in, in advancing herself. I think that uh, we need to think of, of um, Lila's background. Lila, when, <clears throat> excuse me, when we meet her, she has no illusion about how violent people can be, how mean, how bad people can be. Well, uh, if we take a step back and think about her experience within her own family, mm. then that makes all the more sense. Remember, she's the one whose father throws her out of the window. Well, no. you know, she's on, on the first floor. She, they live on the first floor. That's fine. But still, <laughs> think of that violent moment when you know the the, the mm -hmm. five, seven eight years old is thrown out of the window so she she has really faced the most violent part um of humanity within her, the context of her brief life experience elena um elena wants away from her mother if anything um, she, Helena, there is, there is a tenderness between Elena and her father, who doesn't want her to go to school at first, but then he comes along around and it is the father who convinces the mother, and later on it will be the mother who will, who will say, yeah, well, let's, let's send her. Uh, in, in other words, the uh, dynamics, the family dynamics are such that lead us to think that in one case, Elena, she, sure, she, she's equipped she can move on she can fight her battle because she is you know she 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 can find herself uh, discover herself lila cannot in discovering herself which lila has already done she has just found harshness there's no illusion there everybody's violent with towards her uh, the world is a violent place so you know that's the, i would almost um, rationalize that uh, you know now wanting to go beyond with Lila uh, uh, like for uh, for that reason and those reasons. I remember the part that affect one of the parts that affected me a lot was when Lila was working in the the meat the meat packing plant where you know the the physical work she was doing and then her attitude toward the the, the boss when I thought that was you know did quite a job on there uh, but that was such a it was as if she was doing as much as she could to to degrade herself as much as she could for whatever all of those reasons that you mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it yeah. was it was it was heartbreaking. Um, Pina, I um, you, you and I um, heard the the talk by Ann Goldstein the the other day. I don't know if any of the rest of you heard it or not. Um, but one of the um, one of the things that I found interesting was um, the the trans the way she chose to translate the title of of the first book, um, and I think the the rest of the people who are here might might find um, that um, discussion interesting. So, um, if you could elab maybe elaborate a little bit. Well, on maybe the, uh, Susan. Maybe maybe you can remind us of that uh, conversation. I mean, well, the the, the Italian title is Lamica Geniale, uh, so it's the um, genius friend. Mm -hmm. um, whereas um, Anne Goldstein chose to um, in in the translation, it's my brilliant my brilliant friend, and so. Um, Goldstein has has made the choice to personalize uh, to personalize it, um, and um, I, I I I think that that's a uh, I'm not a translator, so I don't I don't know what what goes into translating, but um, it seems to me to choose to change the title is a very bold move. Uh, I mean, it is the title after all. Um, and uh, it, I, I don't know if they said, is this a, a violation of the, mm. the sense or so um, I, uh, it, there is a big difference between the, the um, brilliant friend and my brilliant friend. So 
Well, you know, I'm not sure it is a violation. Uh, one thing that we can be certain of is that Goldstein has worked closely with, uh, with the author, uh, Elena Ferrante. And so um, Goldstein would never go on her own and take off and decide to call something that the author would not approve of. Having said that, um, in Italian, L'Amica Geniale is very loose, as in, you know, the genius, the genial friend. That, that has several meanings. Yes, um, yes. Um, here in English, it becomes a possessive, with a possessive, my brilliant friend. I think you could, argue, you could argue for either one of these two titles to be to ref be reflective of really what is the substance of the novels, you know, um, two really close friends, both of whom in their own rights are brilliant, um, geniuses uh, in their own ways, but which one of them it is, um, and Elena Grieco at one point will say it is, it is Lila, she will recognize that it is Lila who's brilliant, who's geniale. Um, but, but again, I, I, you know, the choice of a translator, again, working closely with, with a narrator, does it change I, the, 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 the meaning? Um, it, it would be, I, I, I don't know, I, to me it doesn't. In English, the genius, the genial friend wouldn't make any, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not, English is not my first language, as you probably have figured out. So you tell me if the genial, my ge the genius, the genial friend makes sense. Uh, I, I think it was a good choice in that switch, you know, in, in switching from uh, the genial to geniale to brilliant. The meaning is the same. That's what I want to say, Susan. Mm -hmm. um, as, 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 um, as fascinating as the conversation that Miss Goldstein had with regard to why this choice, it, it's a good choice. It's the obvious choice, I think, for the English speaking public. Uh, genial would not, I don't think mm. it would do. Uh, the, gen, the genial friend, the friend genial, I, I don't know, I don't know. May I comment? It, it wasn't so much that the, the um, translating uh, geniale as genius as um, replacing the the article with the possessive pronoun. That that I I just I found that as an sort of an interesting choice. Um, absolutely. So. Oh yes, absolutely. That's fine. So, uh, Susan, do you have? Your hand is, stop, is up. I don't know if there is a question or is. I think Judy I wanted to say something. Oh, it's from earlier. I okay, forgot okay. to take it down. But I would love to hear anyone else comment on the friendship aspect because when I think about, and I did not read this with a book group, but my daughters did, and my daughters are in their 30s and 40s. And it was a very popular book group choice. And these are women who are. I mean, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit younger than, than the, the, the characters there, but not by much. But of course, my daughters are a generation later. So for them, the aspect of the friendship, and they're not Italian necessarily. So the questions of dialect and what Naples looks like, they just had to take it at face value and they love the books. Mm. And I think that takes us back to the friendship aspect of um, friendships over a lifetime are, are really complex. Uh, uh, with their competitions and with their love and with their disappointments. I, I think that's a, an aspect, the disappointment that friends can have in one another. When that friend just, you love them, but they didn't live up to your expectation and it happens. Mm -hmm. You might get angry, you might get sad, you might not talk to them for a while. And I feel like that, that was the, may well be, it was a good question at the beginning by Professor Larkin. It, the glue that, that held all the four books together and got so many people involved in the book worldwide, as opposed to an Italian audience or um, a generational audience. So I'd like to hear what other people thought. I hadn't quite uh, thought about it. That way. Uh, if I may, just quickly, I'm reminded of what Cicero says 
you know, he wrote a whole treatise, treatise on friendship. And Cicero says, well, a friend is somebody who mirrors you, uh, in whom you can mirror yourself. And, and I think that at the beginning, certainly, Leela and, and, uh, and uh, what's her name? Leela and Elena can mirror each other, well, you know, are a mirror of each other in the sense that they want the same thing at the beginning. They are, uh, they are fighting for the same things. So that's it. Uh, that was my uh, input about friendship there. I think Judy had her hand up for a while. Yeah. This is the uh, icon of the hand. Anyway, um, I thought these books, I love the books and I love the HBO renditions, uh, but I read them over two years ago and um, I'm left with feeling that they are almost unremittingly grim, sad and grim. Um, and but they don't reflect my life. I don't know. I mean, nobody seemed to take joy in, in uh, a, a beautiful sky or a, a starry night or any of the birds, whatever. Maybe I'm just forgetting. Um, and Elena, Elena was so constrained and so, and so tight. And Leela, I, I, I loved the fact that she was freer to burst out and be outrageous. Um, and yet, I don't know, their lives were very hard, both lives. You have absolutely touched uh, an important aspect of, of these uh, novels. Uh, yeah, there is very little happiness here. Uh, let us not forget that in book three, uh, Leela's daughter disappears. Yep. You know, I mean, here is the moment when things could start being squared. And all of a sudden, the, 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 the infant daughter, the, the young daughter, just is taken away and how tragic you, you're you're right um in what you're saying i totally agree and yet once again i'll go back yeah this is this is the reality of two young women who are trying to push ahead to to make to to change things for themselves mm -hmm. and as they do that there is not a a moment of respite that they can find. It's That's all about fighting the next war. It's all about f overcoming the next obstacles. It's uh, relentless. So that's, that's what I can say about that. But you're absolutely correct. Yeah, these are not happy, happy stories. <laughs> Nothing to do with anything, but my parents uh, were born here, um, but my mother was family was from near Genoa and my father's family was from Sicily. Well, they each spoke their dialects, but they couldn't speak to each other. So I never really learned Italian. I learned a few words here and there, but I mean, hey. <laughs> so I, I, all I've done is since I've been an adult is trying to catch up. Very well. Excellent, excellent. That's what we want to hear. Excellent, very good. But we've been there a million times. My other husband is an Italophile, and oh. uh, it's wonderful. So Yay. that's wonderful. Yes. I, I have a question about uh, uh, Napoli. Um, in, in, in reading the book, there, I, I have a sort of general knowledge of, this, of the city, and I, um, I could kind of picture the Rione and, I, and all the famous Via Toledo, Plebiscito, Garab, all that stuff I vomit or I know where all that is. But there was one image in, in the book that seemed very important, which is this tunnel. And yep. they, they, they go through the tunnel to the beach and various places. And to me, it was a kind of a gateway between the old and the new, the unpleasant and the pleasant, the I don't know, various things. And I'm curious, is, is that a spot that you can recognize when they describe it? Oh, sure, sure. The tunnel is still there. Uh, and yeah, it's I, it's I, right I, there. Uh, I mean- Where, where uh, is it, sort of? Um, okay, let, let me go back to my, the, the fascinating thing is that with the tunnel these days, um, right across from it is where the newspaper Il Mattino, the, the main branch of Il Mattino is. So hang on just a second. Let me see if I can. Um, so you should 
is that's Piazza Mercato, the tunnel is over here. It's quite a distance from where they lived. Um, so I should go, Piazza Municipio. Hang on, I'm, I'm having, here, it's here, the tunnel is. It's, it's basically, um, I wanna say it's, it's, around, it's around this, well, no, this is Piazza del Popolo, Via Nuova Maria. The tunnel is here yeah. in this general area. So as you can see, it's quite a distance from where she lives, which is uh, back here. Behind right? the railroad station, right. Right, behind the, the train station. And the tunnel is nearby the uh, Villa Floridiana, uh, which, is, uh, which is near the water. So it's, it's quite a bit of a, of a thing, of a distance. Um, that's one of them. Then there is another, but that's one that would have to be with Mergelina. It's all of them. Um, and the, you're right. The tunnel is, you know, um, significant in that it it leads to the life they are all aspiring to, and none of them has yet. Right. It um, seemed very a very important piece of imagery in the book to me. Absolutely. You know, I couldn't absolutely. quite place it, and you know, it's it's right. Yeah, yeah. I see. A, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, first of all, Dr. Palm, it's very lovely to see you again. And as always, well, so hello. How are you? I'm all right. Thank you. Um, I've just begun the, the novels. Um, my niece had read all of them and she said, uh, I'm not read them. You're going to love them. Um, uh, I've just be I'm sort of halfway through the first one, but I am impressed as a writer. I'm impressed by the sense of place that uh, that Franti has uh, given us. Um, the city seems to me very gritty. Um, uh, but there's a sense of poverty. Uh, there's also an undercurrent of violence. And, um, and it, it isn't just the overt um, knife against the neck of Michele or whatever, uh, being thrown through the window was horrifying. Mm -hmm. But um, even in the schoolyard, as a teacher, I when those boys were throwing rocks at the girls, I was absolutely horrified again. But um, I was impressed also by the fact that it didn't seem like girls were expected to be educated beyond a certain degree. And um, Leela's obviously had uh, a talent and intelligence and she wasn't going to go very far as far as education. Uh, I said, hooray for the teacher, Oliviero, who went and told Alina's parents to send her to high school. Um, it's, it, it's just, um, I'm in, encouraged to go on listening to everyone's conversation. I'm eager to go and, and finish them. I was up late last night trying to <laughs> get through the first volume. Anyway, great to talk to you again. Dr. Ricci, it's a pleasure to see you and great to talk with you. I'm so very happy that you are reading the novels. Um, I would urge you, as well as everybody else, um, to also look at the days of the abandonment, um, which again, it's uh, why am I plugging that in? Because for those who um, suspect that this might be a man, uh, and somebody earlier on mentioned Sternone, uh, who could possibly be the husband of the author of these novels, but we don't know and we really don't care. Um, if, you, if you read The Days of Abandonment, I think you will get really a clear idea of why I'm saying that this is a woman writing. Um, yes, the, 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 the novels are, once you begin, it's difficult to put it down because it's, you know, it's okay, and what next? Um, it's kind of, reading. Now, let me be clear. Uh, this is no great literature. I've always said, uh, we're not talking about a Tolstoy here. We're not talking about um, uh, a Pavese or any great writers that you think of. But this is superior to, I believe, any uh, of the, oh my goodness, I am missing the name of the uh, Tolkien. Who's the author? Uh, no, I'm sorry, not Tolkien, but the um, uh, oh gosh, the English uh, Roland, Roland. Uh, you know the the the, the J.K. Rowling. Harry, Harry Potter. Right, Harry Potter. 
Yes. Here we are dealing with real lives. Uh, we are dealing with um, with city and, and think about the interplay of the city and the self, the granular. Uh, Dr. Ritchie, to use one of your words before, the granular way in which the city is explained and filtered through the eyes of young people who are at a loss because they are imprisoned into a neighborhood that is a ghetto. You know, there is very little for them. There is only violence uh, that they can resort to. So in that respect, yes, this is great writing, um, if not great literature. Um, I have a, a question. You open this discussion up with why was Elena Ferranti more read in the United States than Italy? You said you would uh, talk about that later. Um, comments on that? Well, uh, I really don't know. I really don't know. Um, it is red, she is red in Italy, uh, but I have to say, um, not as much as others. Um, in the United States and outside of Italy, she became a phenomenon. Everybody wanted to read her. Um, I don't have a quick answer for that, uh, Fran. It's, I don't know. I can only say, I don't know. Um, those who read it, uh, who read her, um, you know, it's okay. It's another book. Um, do you think it has anything to do with the fact that it's so steeped in Naples? Mm. That the, 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 you know, that the attitudes in, in Italy, um, they, they, they are changing about the South, but they it's still exist. I, I, don't, um, I would say that I, I have lots of family in Italy and I would say that every one of them read this before I did and told me to, to read it once it came out. So, and they're from the Alps to the South. So, okay, all right. So we're talking- again, it's, it's just different, you know, I think, I think in the United States, we have a, uh, uh, not a history, but a, a more culture of reading a lot more book groups themselves, all this stuff. I think just in general, I think that's possibly why it's more a phenomenon here. How was it in, but in published in so many languages, uh, certainly everywhere. It's so universal. I, I've, we've all probably read some of the stories by Amy Tan or by you know, Asian writers or Indian writers. Uh, I can't pronounce her name. Jampa Lahiri. Jampa Thank you. Yeah, Lahiri. Who, who, writes, <laughs> right, but, who writes in Italian. Yes. But she purposely wrote that book in Italian. Yes, it was. Yes. Um, yes. But and it's the I same translator. Is this is same uni- translator. Ann Goldstein. A, yep. But it's such yep. a universal story. Mm-hmm. I think you could be, you know, I think this idea of breaking out, breaking out of where you are from and doing something else happens in China and Japan and in India and in England and, and everywhere. I think that's one of the things that makes it universal. And there's probably lots of violent neighborhoods and whatever in all of these places that people are breaking out of. I, I will only say that, uh, Mrs. Feinberg, I, I don't think that uh, um, the South-North uh, dichotomy has a, uh, has a lot to do with it. Uh, it's just, it's just what it is because with other, with other writers who don't, uh, it's the same phenomenon that we see with other writers. Um, so that's all I, I can say to that. It's just out of curiosity. I mean, my, my friend in Italy has gifted me these books in Italian, but, but she has not read them. There you <laughs> oh, go. Oh, no. <laughs> no. I, I'm not sure why. She just sort of shrugs her shoulders. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there is also a certain, um, I, I hate to say this, you know, um, snobbishness. È una parola che esiste, it's not snobismo. Sì, sì, um, sì. So with regard to, I mean, it's, if it's not great literature, why bother? 
you know there is also that dimension but but mm. i you know it's just my own interpretation which could be totally off um yeah I, I have a comment just well i love elena ferrante Excellent. <laughs> as you can see and i had the advantage of reading starting these books after they had all been published so i read one book i could not wait to get to the next one and i must have read them within a month and my feeling was i wish she'd write another book <laughs> even though i know that it was the logical end of the story and i have a comment also about the relationship between elena and and leela um i think elena would never have gotten to where she got without having feeling needed uh, the need to compete with with Leela. I think that was her motivation, um, you know, the motivating force in her life. Compete with Leela. And and that is what sort of propelled her to, uh, you know, her, her success academically um, uh, and in so many ways. And I have one other thought about the film. Uh, I only saw the first, My Brilliant Friend on HBO, and I was getting the sense of, I knew it was shot on set. They created a set because there's no, no place in, in Naples that looks like that anymore. And I thought, oh gosh, it's, you know, I'm seeing the same streets, the same squares all the time. But then I think that was purposeful because you get a sense of the neighborhood being so claustrophobic and why they wanted to get out of there. Yeah, that's a good point. Absolutely, yes. My thoughts. No, very good. Very, <laughs> For whatever very, they're worth. Very, very accurate uh, reading, mm -hmm. wanting to evade, escape even, you know, and uh, it's not just the, 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 the space that is, constrictive and limited it's what goes on within the space right. you know and then now we go back to well it's the culture you know what you do at certain stages given the culture you're you're um, living in uh, or you're brought up in that all it, becomes part of the prison and i just wanted to agree with judy they are very grim books they're not happy but still i had the sense that I didn't want to put them down and I wanted to, and they're not at all predictable. Yep. You know, they're, they just take twists and turns that you could not at all imagine. And I think that's part of why I was so captivated by them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, in that, in that sense, uh, Ferrante is a, is a, um, is a fabulous narrator i mean a, a narrator in the old sense of the world you know the one to affabulare to catch and to draw into the fabula um into the story so that you want forever get to the end of that story and then what she right. what she does is there is always another side in, in a funny way uh, it's almost like a telenovela if you think about it <laughs> no, there is always always something going into another direction the like center a soap opera, right? Uh, the center is always th this this nucleus, uh, Leela and uh, and um, and Elena, uh -huh. but of them, uh, and, and then Nino, of course, of them, mm -hmm. how many things will will develop, and how will they, um, you know, um, uh, what directions they will move on mm -hmm. into? May I say another thing? I don't want to be. Uh keep on talking but i found also very fascinating the fact that the characters weren't the only characters i found that napel was a character okay i found that history was a character i mean i may be putting in because i studied literature that was you know my thing so maybe i'm putting more into it but I, I really thought, especially in the first book, that Naples was as much as a character as all the other characters. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's the history of Naples that really surfaces. Um, and, and I started by showing you the, uh, the, uh, 
uh, the percorso you know, mm -hmm. uh, that, that she does. I mean, the, the streets she navigates and she moves, but, but each one of mm -hmm. those streets really has historical um, um, layers. Um, you know, even when she's on Via dei Tribunali, uh, well, Via dei Tribunali in antiquity was the, the road that led out of the city. Um, mm -hmm. Well, in antiquity, up to uh, 15th, 16th century. Um, you know, you, if you wanted to go out of Naples, you will go by that, uh, on that road, which led to the, to the door uh, that would then lead you northward. I, I mean, it, it's all, it's all uh, very, very clear what, she, what the, 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 the narrator is doing. You know, it's just taking us on this journey with, with her uh, main protagonist. And, you know, well, well it's, it's uh, um, fundamental to the whole work is this relationship friendship which sometimes turns into an enmity but but it's uh, it's where the uh, the um, it's where the the story becomes complex and yet beautiful beautiful and yet tragic tragic and yet you know charming it's all of those things when you think of the of the two uh friends what's really interesting is to see how passionate everyone is uh, the, the readers of Ferrante that, you know, what I'm hearing over and over again is I couldn't put it down. And um, it, it's interesting to think about the reasons for the connections that people make um, through, you know, intergenerational, um, intercultural, it doesn't matter with this story. Um, this hasn't happened, I think, for an Italian author, I'm thinking the last time that it did probably th almost 30 years with Susanna Tamaro, who is not as, is not the author that Ferrante is. The, I mean, Va Dove si porta il cuore was, was not a very good novel, I think. Um, and, and, these, and these are, but it's interesting to see, you know, what, what is it about this that really um, inspires these kinds of conversations? Well, I, I would say because she, Ferrante has uh, the ability to put so many elements in this novel. You know, it's the history, it's the city, it's the friendship, it's the love, it's the hate, it's the violence. I mean, here we're looking at the incipit of, of uh, the Camorra, you know, uh, it's all of these things. Now, if you want to talk about Naples, just as, as, the, um, as uh, about some beautiful novels, uh, that regard Naples. Well, go read Fabrizio Ramondino. And Fabrizio Ramondino is phenomenal. And yet, when it comes to um, human interrelations, uh, Ramondino lacks. Mm -hmm. yeah. So at the other end of the spectrum, Elsa Morante, Il mare no ba non bagna Napoli. And with Elsa Morante, it's a whole other. Uh, but again, not with, with the... Um, the brio, the um, the vividness that Ferrante is cap is, is capable of bringing in. Mm -hmm. So I think that plays a big role in this uh, in in this phenomenon that is, uh, you know, the uh, the Neapolitan novels. Mm -hmm. A light note. I think it was the shoes. <laughs> Well, yes, of course. The, the, I mean, just as I made, made me, I tell you, it makes me want to have one pair in my life of handmade Italian shoes. <laughs> and, just for me. And, and I think that the, the ending of book one was absolutely brilliant with, with him walking in with that pair of shoes. I you know, just want to strangle the bastard. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but I think the the designing of the shoes and the talking of that was was something but that's just yeah. I wish there had been a picture of the shoes I couldn't imagine what they look like I have a picture of a pair of shoes designed by Dolce and Gabbana and they were on a window in uh, Milano I took three years ago they are the most gorgeous they've got a whole bunch of fancy women's shoes with they got sneakers with fur, they got all kinds of stuff, but this pair of men's shoes, like wingtips with all this little design, the most gorgeous shoes you've ever seen, about a thousand dollars. They were absolutely, they, I, I picture them, those are the shoes.
that she not just... worth it. I have a pair of uh, oh, what's his, um, his name boots that I bought in 1980. Believe oh. it or not, the famous uh, Bruno Magli. I'm still wearing them today. That's how well made they were. Well, funny you should mention that because I have these. They happen to be behind. <laughs> these are made in Florence, and I bought them 20, uh, 1994, 19, 1996. I bought them a half a size too small because I love them like a fool, right? Because they're practically brand new because I can't wear the damn thing. I can't wear them because they're just a little too narrow and small, but they are so gorgeous. And uh, now my granddaughter, who is 13, is just about the right size for them. And yeah. she, so I'm giving them to her. Good. They're well, new. I bought these shoes in, I don't know if you can see them, but I, they're handmade. I bought them in Florence. They're beautiful. Thank you. They cost me a small fortune, but, but I love them. And they are wing, they're wing tips as you, yeah. you described. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Oh, it's really the shoes. <laughs> wow. The shoe. You're right. Well, I think uh, on, and the, on that end. Uh, I have a flask. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. We used to drink from. You'll drink like this. Oh, boy. Nice. Um, okay. Well, those were the days when Alan Ferrand was growing up. <laughs> Well, <laughs> Professor Palma, um, this was this was a great discussion. Uh, I'm sure everyone agrees uh, because uh, there were no. This was not a shy Zoom meeting, so I'm I'm very glad for that that um, that we got to hear from so many of you, and thank, thank you, you so much invite. for there taking. Thank you for taking us beginning with this tour of Naples, this literary this tour, and. Um, Thank you for um, leading this conversation on these novels that are so beloved. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity you've given me. And uh, thank you all for participating. And I invite everybody to go on Google Map and, you know, go through those areas yourselves. And you can find also beautiful pictures of, uh, of the area that I have that we discussed. Meanwhile, just keep reading and be a Ferrante or anybody else. Just keep reading. <laughs> Arrivederci. Thank you so much. Grazie. Grazie. Okay. Well, my Grazie. pleasure. Mm -hmm.